Hello everyone, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to Open Source Software Development. Hope everybody's staying safe and well out there. Today I want to talk a little bit about setting up an open source project. Once you've got your project figured out, what you want to do, once you understand a little of the way open source works, then it's probably time to dive into the mechanics of how to get things going. As somebody who has put up on GitHub literally a couple of hundred or open source projects, I'll share you roughly what my process is, and hopefully that will be something that you can try to replicate or adapt for your situation. Started. So the overarching goals here, figure out what you're doing. We've already talked some about choosing a project, but narrowing it down is also going to be a thing. And then you're going to have two kinds of targets, typically in an open source project. You're going to have technical targets. What do you actually want to build? And you're going to have community targets. How do you want this to be used? How do you want to distribute it? How do you want to get people involved with developing? So let's talk about a process that's pretty standard for getting projects started that meets all of these. I'm going to make a big deal of names. I think naming an open source project is super important and a bad or lazy name can be a real problem for your project going forward. It's one of the first commitments you have to make to your project because you're probably stuck with it for the long haul. If you're not, it probably means that something went horribly wrong with the naming, so you really don't want to be in that position. So here's some properties a good name should have. It should be unique, it should be distinctive, it should be searchable, it should be trademark free. As somebody who's worked with both the Z specification notation, spelled Z, and the X window system, those were unfortunate names for a project because they're very hard to search for. The trademark thing is really important. We'll talk later about foundations of law, but if your project is similar to some trademark name or dilutes the value of some trademark name, you need to avoid you know, a name that would do that. The name should be unique and distinctive. It should be something that's unique to your project. There have been a lot of problems over the last 20 years in open source with fairly large projects getting fairly large before realizing there was a really fundamental naming collision or conflict with something that people knew in that space, some name people knew in that space. You don't want to be there. Your name ideally will describe somehow what you're doing and you know what what the properties of your project are it's been trendy over the last while to give up on this and name things things like google or yahoo that really don't have any descriptive significance for what it is you're trying to do you can do better than that try to pick a name that will help people understand and remember what it is you're building you want the name to be short and easy to pronounce. Typically, one to three syllables, and really one or two is better than three, is ideal as far as name length. You don't want it to be hard to spell. You don't want it to be hard to say. And those are properties that, for naming anything, but especially for naming a software project, are really good properties to have. Yes, it would be great if it's interesting, if it's amusing, if it's fun. Names that are sticky help you get your project out there and uh, that's fantastic that's a more sacrificable goal though if you have to can't find a fun name that also works in these other ways leave the fun out of it but you know we're computer scientists we like words and puns and that kind of stuff if we're a software developer that's going to be part of our game plan and there's nothing wrong with going there the name really needs to be usable as an identifier, so weird spellings and that kind of stuff, not so great. And again, length, not so great. You're probably going to name your GitHub repo or GitLab repository after your project. You're probably going to use your project's name in various places as titles and labels and tags and that sort of thing. And so an identifier-ish name would be really good. I've linked in the notes for this some naming guides there's several good ones out there i picked three that i thought were nice they say mostly these same things and i would encourage you to spend some time thinking 
reading, working about it. I want to be clear for my course that I'm teaching this summer that I won't take garbage names. I won't take course project. I won't take a name with CS461 or similar in it. I won't take names that are names like Snake Game. I mean, you got to pick a name. Pick a good one. It's really, really important to me. Name it something meaningful for the long. Once you had a name, another thing that you need to pick out is a license. And again, I'll have a much more detailed discussion of legal and licensing at some point, but it really doesn't have to be very complicated. Go to opensource.org, which is the home of the open source initiative that we talked about last lecture, and look at the licenses. I really, really suggest that unless you have some really clear goals not to or that exclude it or whatever, you do one of three things. First of all, if you're working with or interoperating with code that's under some existing open source license, or if you're working in a community where a particular open source license is pervasive, unless you have a really good not reason not to use that one, you don't want to make things unnecessarily complicated in terms of your license is weird and doesn't fit well, or maybe doesn't fit at all with the license being used by another project. So try to make your licensing conform to other people's licensing. Again, if you have strong opinions of some kind, that's fine, but I find most people, including myself, mostly don't. And so I try to pick the license that fits best with the community. Otherwise, you have a choice really between the GPL or the MIT style license. Uh, you know, MIT, BSD with, you know, two clause BSD are both reasonable open source licenses, like we talked about last lecture. The GPL, the viral license, is the most reasonable free software license. There's a bunch of other variants, but these are the ones I always encourage people to look at first. And here's how I tend to choose in my projects between those. If I think for this project, the hardest thing is going to be attracting a lot of quality developers then I may choose the GPL because there are a lot of developers out there still that won't work on a non-GPL project, a non-free software project. If I feel strongly about how other people use my code, if I want the viral predictions that the, the license enforces, I'll choose the GPL. A, little, a less recognized benefit of choosing the GPL is that the Software Freedom Consortium and until recently, the Software Freedom Law Center have been good about providing support for people who have legal issues around the GPL. And so if you feel like you might be in a situation where you'd have these kinds of things go on and you, need some you might need some legal or license help, choosing the GPL means probably that you're going to be a little better supported. This is a marginal thing, but it is one of the reasons I might choose the GPL. On the other hand, if for a particular project, I think the hardest thing is attracting a lot of users, getting the software out there so that a lot of people, you know, grab it and use it and develop it on their own. And, or if I'm worried about the, like the legal situation the other way around, I don't want my users to have to worry about all the complicated provisions and squabbles and incompatibilities of the GPL then I usually use the MIT license. I'll just put that on there. I have a lot of MIT licenses. And so those are typically my choices when I'm picking a license project. There are definitely a bunch of other perfectly valid and good licenses out there. There are definitely dual licensing that a lot of people are using these days. Go out and do your own research to some extent, but don't get too hung up on the license. It's one of those things that, yes, there again, you're probably making a commitment that will last for the life of the project, at least once you get developers outside your initial group, then it's going to become increasingly hard to change the license. But on the other hand, the licenses I mentioned are very good and you probably will be happy. Now you're going to set up the project. You're going to get your repo repo going. You're going to make a Git repository because Git is the source code management system of choice these days. And you'll set up on GitHub or maybe on GitLab or possibly on some other Git repo site, although I really recommend GitHub and GitLab for this kind of work. You'll set up a repository. You'll 
get an account for yourself, let's say at github.com, you'll create a project following the instructions on GitHub, which are really clear and easy to use. Again, GitLab has both of these things as well. And then you'll figure out what you need to do beyond there to get things up and running the way you want. Now you're gonna to have to grab your programming tools and environment, make sure that you and anybody else on your team is set up to actually be able to develop and run programs. I really encourage you, unless it's a language and libraries, et cetera, that you're really, really familiar with to make one of your first tasks in your new project, just doing a toy Hello World-ish example of everything and proving to yourself that it's all gonna work. I've been surprised on my own right, and I've watched students be surprised about how Sometimes things that you just knew would work don't actually work, so it really pays to get things running. If you ha need a build environment of some kind, if you're, for example, working in C or C++, you will, then get that set up so that you're sure that you can do reproducible builds of, well, reproducible, you know, repeatable builds of whatever it is. You Make is a fantastic tool. Auto Tools is showing its age. I have a friend who's using Mason a lot. I'm using Rust a lot these days, and Cargo is fantastic. But get your build environment set up in there again. Make sure that you understand how it works and how to use it really, really early on. Finally, you're going to want you to get your README typically in Markdown format set up in your repo and pushed up to the upstream repo, pushed up to GitHub or GitLab that has the information about your project in it. And I would encourage you to do that before you've written a line of code. Get a readme written down saying what your project's name is, what it is you're doing, who the authors are, and what license it's under, and get that written and up so that you have something up there that's a placeholder for your project, but also gets you in the habit of actually working with the source code management system to update the project as changes happen. You really want that all to be central and not just in some directory on your laptop. I had a student once write a really nice piece of software for me, or at least I assume it was really nice, but before they could get it uploaded, because they didn't upload it from the beginning, their laptop was literally hit by a firework. They said later that it probably been fine until they threw the, somebody threw a bucket of water on the laptop to try to put it out, and that was the end of that software. Find a group of two to four people in this course that have a common interest. Figure out what you want to do. You can do this kind of stuff. We've talked about a lot of this already. Um, I need you to, you know, open source software is often best done in groups. I have a lot of individual repos, like I say, a couple hundred. It's not great. A lot of my best projects have been ones I've done with other people. Um, you need to figure out Again, what not just what programming language you're going to use, but what libraries, frameworks, what kinds of assets do you need, and how are you going to get all that together? And yeah, really, you can't commit and push too early. It's not really a thing that's possible. I think I've said all this already. Add a readme and license to your project first thing make a project roadmap. So the last thing I'm gonna ask, I would suggest you do on any open source project, and for my class I'm gonna ask everyone to do, is to put a roadmap right there in the readme before you've written any code or anything. This is what I expect to do, this is when I expect it to be done. You know, for my class, what do you expect to do this quarter? What do you expect to do after the quarter's over? Really, for this course, you should expect that by the end of week three of the course or so, you should have some kind of little runnable demo or prototype or starter piece of code so that you're confident that you can flesh that out. There again, the open source way is to get a minimal thing up and then incrementally expand it into the thing you actually wanted. And that approach works wonders. Improving a working piece of code or debugging a working piece of code is way, way easier than trying to build out a thing that you don't know if it will be more reliable. The debugging process is a lot easier when you've made a small change to a work. So really that's a thing you should do.
And again, for my course, but it's a good idea for everybody in open source, have some kind of minimum viable product. What do I, when is the first time I'm gonna suggest that at least alpha or beta users actually use my software? And if that's a library, that means download it and integrate it with some, something they're building with an application. It means download it and try to run it. That doesn't need to have all the features, but it should be enough features that you're comfortable with it. And that's important to have done in advance. If you don't think you can do that in the time frame you want, in this case, I'm suggesting by week five or six of the course, then you probably have too big a scope for what you're trying to do. The point is it's really, really easy to underestimate scope and really hard to overestimate it. So you really wanna make sure that you set your time frame tight enough that you have time for some slack, have time for your underestimates to get fixed, and have some time to do the kind of polishing and getting ready to go. That's really important when you're getting a project to the stage where you really want to build a community. And then you off your and running. You start to commit your code, start to commit your documents, et cetera, to the project, and you are building a piece of open source software. So it's really that easy. It takes some thought, it takes some effort, but it's something you can do fairly quickly and it can have really nice results if you set that framework. You know, this is the ground floor of a structure you're building. If you set that ground floor right, the rest of the structure is gonna go up very well. Hope that was useful to you. Thanks so much for listening. Again, stay safe and well out there and I will talk to you again soon.